Derek, thanks for taking the time out to join us. I certainly have a lot of questions for you, but I know before we get into that, you had some things you wanted to say. Well, first of all, I appreciate you allowing me the time to come on and speak, and I won't be long in, in my opening statement, but first of all, this basically marks my 30th year in this field, in this business. I went to college to play football in 1988, and I've been on a campus almost every day since then with a short stint at the NCAA office. So putting a lot of work in this business, in this field, educating young people, and also had the privilege to raise a former student athlete who also was a football player when I was the athletic director at Tulsa. And our first job in this business, in the administration, is to safeguard the well-being and the safety of our student athletes. And you hear that all the time, but it's not a cliche. And so that's why this situation is so particularly distressing. And I look at it from a lot of different angles, from an athletic director's standpoint, an administrator, a former student athlete, an alum, and then a parent. Because again, I was the parent of a student athlete. So what I do want everybody to know is that we are committed to fixing all the problems and overcoming all the challenges that we've been dealing with, the president, the board of trustees, and everybody involved with the university, and to ensure that nothing like this ever occurs again. I mentioned the players aren't here today. What was the process of them making that decision? Well, obviously, that, that was their decision. And again, in trying to safeguard their safety and well-being and their mental health, we wanted to support them in their decision-making process. We had discussions about it. And, but at the end of the day, and, and they said it, they themselves don't want to be a distraction for the process for what is going on and for the other student athletes across the conference. And I respect that and I support their decision. Well, they are not here. Your new head football coach, interim coach David Braun is here. Give us a sense of what it's been like working with him these last few weeks as he's kind of gotten up to speed very quickly and becoming a head coach and tried to hold everything together and move it forward. Well, absolutely, and, and Coach Braun has been great. And I saw really the way that the student athletes take to him, and that was a part of elevating him to this position. He had a lot of support from inside. And it's interesting, on the defensive side of the ball, a lot of the offensive players talked about how he's gotten to know them and how they hadn't had that type of experience before. So he was able to come in in a very short time and really have a large effect on the entire program in a short amount of time. And so he's, he's dealing with a lot. His wife is pregnant, as you may know, and uh, he's, the, he's the father of, of young children. And just when you put it in perspective, just about six months ago, he was probably one of the top defensive coordinators on the FCS level. And now he's the interim head coach at a big time, Big Ten conference program. And I think he's handling it really well. He's done a great deal of outreach. And I think, as we always say, the seat next to the bigger seat is always a million miles away. And I think he's probably experiencing a lot of that. But um, his maturity level is something that's really impressive. And to be able to deal with this, and he'll probably say more about it, obviously, uh, would not want to come into a situation like this under these circumstances, but these are the circumstances we're dealing with, and he's handling it very well. Derek, I want to dive into the allegations surrounding the football program, and I'm going to start with this. This interview that you and I are doing is the first time that any Northwestern administrator has appeared on camera during this. This has been going on for nearly three weeks. President Schill has released a few statements you have not spoken publicly. Why has Northwestern chosen to remain silent throughout all of this? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the complexities of the legal situation that may be occurring. So what I wanted to do was really focus mainly internally, because again, the student athletes are our first priority. And so we started working from the inside out. President Shields been managing things externally and getting out the messages he wants to get out. And I certainly would never be, uh, want to do anything that preempts the president or the administration of the university. And so everybody felt like this would be a great opportunity for me to publicly uh, be outward facing, which is, which is what this is all about. But internally, we've had a lot of discussions starting with the student athletes, the teams, the student athletes, the, the coaches, the head coaches in particular. We had an all staff meeting earlier this week. And so I've talked to, as you can imagine, a numerous amount of donors, boosters, alumni, trustees, 
and that has been basically nonstop the last two or three weeks. So we wanted to focus in on, on the inside of the house, and now we're able to get out some messages. But certainly you acknowledge that people have kind of run roughshod over Northwestern during this time period. I mean, hindsight's 2020, I suppose, but was this the right strategy given the way that Northwestern has seen its reputation suffer? Well, again, I, I would go back to the, the legal complexities of the situation. Okay. Um, I mean, those legal complexities still exist. Yes, they right do. Now. All right, fair enough. Um, let's get into the firing of Pat Fitzgerald. To what extent were you looped in initially when President Schill determined that the best punishment for Pat Fitzgerald was a two-week suspension? Right. I was uh, part of a small team that delivered that message to Pat Fitzgerald. And I think there's some questions about my, my uh, whereabouts during the situation. And so uh, very involved initially. So did you feel like a two-week suspension was the right punishment at the time? Well, that's something, again, with the legal situation that we're not commenting a lot on the actual process. Had you read the external report that Maggie Hickey, the attorney, put together before that punishment was handed down to Pat Fitzgerald? Had you read the entire report? Again, uh, we're not discussing the, the report and the process. And uh, I, I want to be careful about what I say on the record regarding whether it's the report or the process. Why is Northwestern chosen not to release that report? I can't speak to that, but it's a, a private institution. And, and again, I don't want to get into the details of the report. What do you believe Pat Fitzgerald knew about what was going on inside the football program? I certainly can't speak to what I thought Coach Fitzgerald thought about what was going on in the program. That's not a question that I would be able to get into. What, what do you think he should have known? Like, do you share the belief that President Schill, the sentiment from him when he kind of reversed his course from the initial two-week suspension to the firing of Pat Fitzgerald, that, that it was based on what Pat Fitzgerald should have known that was going on in his program? Well, I think that the president's been very public about his sentiments and his thoughts and, and decision making in this process. And I obviously support the president and the decision that was made. You have an assistant coach, Matt McPherson, who is still on the staff, who was mentioned in one of the lawsuits that came out this week as having witnessed hazing. Again, that's an allegation in a lawsuit, but he's still on the staff, at least as far as I know. Right. Can you update us on Matt McPherson's status within the program? Yes, that situation, every employee, no matter if it's a, a coach or university employee, is afforded due process. And so that situation is being looked into and investigated. And any other allegations that come forward out of this situation or anything in the future will be heavily vetted, but again, everybody is afforded due process. Do you have a sense as to when that due process will play out and what is his role with the program while you're investigating those allegations? Right, we don't, we don't have a timetable on that, but right now he's still an assistant coach. I wanna ask a little bit about the vetting process at Northwestern and kind of the, 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 the mechanisms that are in place for situations like this one. So give me a sense for what road a student athlete can take as of a month ago, before all of this broke, what road they can take if they feel like there is something going on in the program, such as hazing or any other behavior which they find offensive. How were they, what was the reporting structure for them to, to let administrators know this is going on. Right, well, and like many universities, there's a reporting mechanism. Any student athlete or student can report any type of allegation anonymously. And in, But in this situation, this information came in directly into our compliance office from through an email. And what I'm proud about is, and, and again, my history, unlike most athletic directors, I have a deep history and compliance. I was over compliance. I was the compliance director at Michigan, Arkansas, and Missouri in years past. So uh, I believe in integrity and in telling the truth. 
and not burying the information. And this entire situation started with a self-report. And once we received the information, we reported it directly to the office of the general counsel, which is appropriate. And then again, there is a reporting mechanism where anybody, any student or any student athlete could report things anonymously and um, that protects their identity and, and those types of things. And we're also going to work to shore that system up and make sure that everybody knows that it's available. I'm interested, this hazing, this culture has apparently been permeating the Northwestern football program, if you believe the, the media reports, for 30 years. And I'm just curious, given this anonymous structure that was in place, to your knowledge, and again, I know you've only been there a couple of years, but to your knowledge, had there ever been any complaints about what was happening in the football program prior to this whistleblower? To my knowledge, no. I, and I hadn't seen anything except for this one specific report. Simultaneous to all of this going on, you had some challenges within the baseball program. You had a, a coach who you had hired last year uh, as early as November there were complaints about his comportment around the players and, and some staff members. Uh, he, the season obviously went very poorly. Um, there was a lot of unhappiness throughout the, the course of the year, which you were aware of. Why did it take so long to fire Jim Foster? Again, that's uh, every employee is afforded due process. And that situation was investigated. And again, that was on information that we ourselves turned over. And with that situation, any leader who makes decisions has to own what they do. And, and no athletic director gets all of their hirings correct. And so um, I own that decision. And then I own the process after that. And I think it's led to the right decision, obviously, with him being relieved of his duties. As these lawsuits have come out, you, you had one filed by a former volleyball player this week. Uh, you have a number of other programs which have been mentioned as possibly having hazing issues within their program. Uh, there's also been allegations of racism within the athletic program. And I think there's just kind of this image right now, Derek, of Northwestern having an athletic program that has just kind of run amok here. What is your response to kind of these broad-based allegations that the university is failing its student-athletes? Right. Well, obviously, that's the job of, of myself and the president. And both of us are very new, as we know. We inherited some, a lot of these things, or most of them. And so it's our job to correct them. The brand has taken on a large amount of, of challenges. And that's the university, the athletic department, some of us personally. I feel bad for some of the coaches who are hearing allegations for the first time from former student athletes. But I think a big part of it is communication and strategy and what we plan to do going forward. And I can tell you that any allegation that comes in will be seriously vetted and investigated. And regardless of the outcome, we're gonna do the right thing. Do you think there is a culture problem? I mean, just with the number of allegations that have come out is, is it just seems like it's something that people should have been aware of how does it how does it get how does something this pervasive get missed right well I, I don't want to uh, paint a broad brush over everyone within the athletics department and one of the I, I talked to the staff about this the other day and we just and they turned in what was basically the best year in 15, 16 years, athletically and academically combined as an athletic program. But nobody is recognizing that obviously because of what's going on. So I really think that that's the main culture. We have had situations that are challenging just like other universities. And, and again, it's about finding ways to fix those challenges and then to make sure that they never happen again. So that's what we're concentrating on right now. What has your message been to the current student athletes, and I'd say primarily the football players, and we're here at football media days, and the football program has been under the most scrutiny here. What has your message to them been as they try to pick up the pieces and move forward? Well, number one, just stick together. And, and anybody from the outside, uh, that, that may seem pretty simple, but having been a former student athlete, and I empathize with these guys, and 
I lost my coach going into my senior year, and I didn't try to say that it was on this level because there are a lot of different things about the situation. And back then, everything was a lot more private than it is today. So I can at least empathize with them. But they stick together, concentrate on the main things that brought them to Northwestern, the education, and then obviously wanting to be a student athlete there. And hopefully, once we get into camp next week, begin to try to normalize things. I think being on the quarter system is very helpful right now because they can just concentrate on being together, concentrate on, on the, the hazing, uh, anti-hazing education and some of the social justice things we're going to do during that period and then start playing obviously September 3rd and then get into classes a little bit later so we're emphasizing that we're emphasizing that we're concerned about their security we've had security officers come in and address the team and uh, and we've had our obviously we have one of the best sports psychology departments in the country so we have them interfacing anybody who needs help we we also emphasize that if you need help please ask for it we have uh, counselors right there inside the building which is different from a lot of places and so we're doing everything we possibly can to shore up the systems around the student athletes Derek is it more challenging given that this was brought about by the treatment of players between one another? In other words, how they were treating each other, that, that you have to kind of mend those wounds which have to exist within the program? Well, I, I think that's a part of it, obviously, in any type of situation like this. Um, and that it's, it's a huge learning moment for everyone involved. And your heart goes out to anybody that was victimized. And um, your heart just goes out to everybody involved in the situation. We have several or many young men whose parents dropped them off on campus a few weeks ago. Yeah. And then their lives have been changed and flipped upside down almost immediately. And so um, we're dealing with that too. Uh, one last question for you. Uh, as you know, this situation has frankly caused, I think, a lot of unhappiness and embarrassment and sadness for fans, for alums, for current students people who really love their university. What's your message to those people in terms of getting them to support Northwestern and the endeavor on the field? Right, well, again, Northwestern, the reason I came to Northwestern is because it operates at the highest levels academically and athletically. And I think that's just the basis of what the university is all about. It's a founding member of the Big Ten and obviously part of the fabric of the university. So I think, and I've been messaging this too, because as you can imagine, some people, we're dealing with a myriad of emotions. But at the end of the day, I think at the end of those conversations, they understand that it's not about me. It's not about whatever the hit on the brand is. It's really about the institution and their commitment to it. And so I just ask that everybody continue to commit to and support the student athletes, because that's what it's about. And that's the reason I got in this business 30 years ago. And that's the reason I'm still in it today. Derek Gregg, thanks a lot for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it.